It's the seventh year of the Iroku period, and somewhere in a random forest, Shinsuke profusely sweats while hiding in the bushes because he has encountered three bandits. He readies himself to engage them, but he pauses when Jinka and Tama catch the attention of the criminals. Tama tells them to stop their unlawful behaviors and get honest jobs. The criminals can't believe that some brats are trying to give them life lessons and laugh it off. The mood suddenly changes when the bad actors unsheath their weapons and order the duo to shut their yaps and drop their valuables. Jinka responds by hitting the one giving the orders in the face with his stick. He finishes them off by activating some earth talismans that form fists that knocks their attackers out. He finds their demise amusing but Tama is not impressed with his actions, so she punches him and reveals that they can't find the location of their hideout with them being unconscious. Jinka doesn't think that they would have shared that information if they were conscious. She ignores his blunder and says that they will just have to find it the hard way. Shinsuke can't believe what he just witnessed and wonders who these strange travelers are, so he decides to tail them to get more information. Tama hears his movements in the bushes but opts to leave him for the time being. The duo arrives at a river and take a break. Jinka fills his bamboo water bottle in the river while Tama grabs a bite to eat. Shinsuke's constant rustling annoys her, so she throws a stone which hits its mark. Tama tells him to show himself, and the guy emerges with a nosebleed and a giant bruise on his face cheek, looking like he received one mighty slap from Will Smith. He states his name and informs them that he's on a warrior's pilgrimage. He's interested to know what technique Jinka used to defeat the bandits. He informs the samurai that it's none of his business before turning to his elder sister for them to proceed. Shinsuke is shocked to hear him address her as the older sister. As they leave, he gets their attention by informing them that he knows where the bandits' hideout is. This catches their attention, so he proposes a deal where they tell him about themselves in exchange for the location. Jinka introduces himself as an ascetic sage called a Sendu. Tama reveals that she's a demon fox spirit and that the two of them are sworn siblings. The sage discloses that he used talisman sorcery with his spirit power to summon the Earth Fists. Shinsuke laughs at their introductions, thinking that they are jesting with him. Tama cuts him off by threatening to toss a snake at him if he doesn't show them the way. The samurai gets terrified and falls in line. Tama throws the snake down as they leave to reveal that she used magic to turn a stick into a snake. After a short journey, they arrive at the hideout of the bandits. Shinsuke drops some exposition revealing that the criminals are called the Onikabuto Group. They are a well-known group of outlaws in this territory. He points out their leader who sits there with his helmet on. According to sources, he's as strong as an Oni, and no one has ever seen him without his helmet on. They claim that he has horns underneath the headgear. Tama comments on how well-informed he is. Jinka guessed that he had unrealistic fantasies about making a name by hunting bandits. This would lead to him getting hired into the service Mighty Lord. Shinsuke doesn't see anything unrealistic about that, as he understands it as a great plan that allows him to train and get accomplishments to his name. He doesn't see what they are doing to be any different. Tama corrects him that they do have a different goal, and she has no intention of sharing it with someone who gets scared of snakes. He simply informs her that he has a phobia. Shinsuke assures them that he's decent with a sword. The samurai loudly utters that his helm-splitting strike could take out the bum bandits below. The whole hideout hears his proclamation and quickly converge on the trio. Tama is not too fussed because her aim was to talk sense into them anyway. They are brought before the leader. The fox spirit gets straight to the point by criticizing the leader for leading such an unlawful operation. She demands they disperse and see their villainy. Everyone begins to laugh, but Tama doesn't get disheartened as she outlines the steps they could take to make a brighter future for themselves. Shinsuke is shocked that she was looking for the hideout just to do talk no jutsu. Her second rant annoys the criminals, so they rush to attack her. Jinka intercepts taking them out with one swing. The bandit boss gives the order for his subordinates to eliminate them. Shinsuke watched in amazement as the duo put up a good fight because the Onikabuto group is pretty much untouchable. He wildly draws his blade when he's thrusted into the fight. He hesitates for a moment but gathers the courage to successfully land his helm-splitting strike on a bandit. Tama is impressed that he pulled it off. All the while, Shinsuke gets high on the adrenaline and rushes to attack the leader. He comes down with the same attack, but it's blocked by a pair of demon hands that sprout from the helmet, and the samurai is kicked back. Tama labels it as Katawara, which is a spirit of the dead. The otherworldly creature complains because Shinsuke forced him to come out. Is it me, or does this mofo look like Red Skull's unspoken cousin? The other bandits get scared that their boss is a monster. The demon promises to end anyone that tries to run. Tama asks Jinka if he can beat the creature. The guy points out that it must be strong if it managed to stay hidden for so long. He thinks that he can take it out if they perform a spirit transformation. Tama draws blood from herself with a bite which activates her power. Jinka kneels and takes a sip which completes the ritual. Jinka's hair turns white and he gains some tails. 
Shinsuke is shocked by what he's witnessing. Tama explains that a spirit transformation is a technique where one harmonizes with a demon spirit. This practically transforms the host into spirit. The creature promises to end all his subordinates if they don't take out Jinka first. The sage uses little effort to dispose of the fodder bandits, which doesn't surprise the demon. So the creature takes matters into its own hands as it attacks. Tama assures Shinsuke that Jinka will be fine when he comments about him facing such a foe with only a staff. Our boy doesn't know that the stick has the same infinite durability as the Nokia brick and Luffy sandals. Our boy doesn't know that the stick has the same infinite durability as the Nokia brick and Luffy sandals. Hey, what are you doing? You got fired. Get out of here. Sorry. Anyway, Jinka easily dodges the demon's attacks and launches an overpowering counter that defeats the monster. The samurai watches on impressed as the sage releases the transformation. Tama's hair goes back to normal as her powers return. Jinka notices that the demon was controlling a corpse and bids it farewell as he finishes the exorcism. Tama informs a curious Shinsuke she likes humans, so she makes a habit of getting rid of those who would engage in evil. Jinka says that he's going just along for the ride. The samurai is taken aback to hear that there is a demon that likes humans. Tama makes him aware that they dislike this barbaric age, and their duo will be known as the siblings for world reformation, since their aim is to change things for the better. Shinsuke continues following them, and Jinka wants to lose him, but Tama is okay with his presence for now. The samurai is still in shock after learning for the first time that such creatures exist. He gets excited at the thought of stumbling into an incredible world. They arrive at a small village, and Shinsuke is surprised to see them lodging at an inn for the night. He follows them to the establishment and finds a man narrating to the duo and two monks how he was attacked by a giant monster that afternoon. A warrior monk from the Dangaishu called Seiren was around and tried to exterminate it, but he was taken out with one stomp. The man even draws the creature for all to see. With such drawings, I might get him to start doing my thumbnails. Uhu punches the ground with anger when he hears that Saren has met his demise. The senior monk informs everyone present that they will deal with the monster, because the Dangaisu are demon-fighting monks. Shinsuke has joined the conversation at this point, and discreetly alerts Jinka that the monks might try to exterminate Tama if they find out that she's a demon. The sage informs him that the Dangaisu already know. Tama explains that they are an order of warrior monks who cultivated spiritual power to fight demons. However, they don't exterminate without reason. The group only targets demons that pose a threat to humans. Shinsuke is impressed with her knowledge, she informs him that it's expected given how long she has lived. The fox spirit is more interested in what the samurai is doing in their business. She recalls him saying that he was on a warrior's pilgrimage. She suspects that Shinsuke might be interested in joining their group, so she makes a comment about it. The samurai badly denies it and says that his presence is merely a coincidence because they are all going in the same direction. He also decides to stay at the inn since it is getting late. As he pretends to sleep, Tama remarks that the strike he launched at the demon earlier had a lot of heart behind it. Later that night, Shinsuke heads out to practice as everyone sleeps. While he swings, he recalls how he was bullied when he revealed that his dad was a samurai. The other kids found it difficult to believe that a weakling like him could be the offspring of the warrior class. As he currently swings, he notes that he was able to expose the demon with his sword and wonders if he could slay one. If he has that potential, then he feels like these meetings are fate. Whether he ends up with Tama and Jinka or the Dangaisu, it doesn't matter to him. He's sure that if he can learn from them, then maybe his sword can strike down monsters. He gets startled because Tama says the same words. She guesses that that's what he was thinking as she kicks him into the well. Jinka informs him that he should know his place. Shinsuke demands to know how long those two have been there for. He warns them not to read his mind without permission. Tama informs him that she did no such thing, revealing that his thoughts were written all over his face. The duo headed back inside after realizing that his departure was nothing to worry about. The following morning, Shinsuke wakes up to find the room empty. He quickly rushes out of the inn in disbelief that all of them are early risers. The samurai was hoping that he would get to witness another demon fight. As he reaches the outskirts of the village, he spots both groups standing there. The guy stops as he gets closer and hides when he notices Jinka and Uhu facing off. The giant monk pleads for him to step aside and leave earthly affairs to those who live in the world of men. Jinka lets him know that he could care less for the affairs of men. He refuses to move until they give him a good reason why they want to harm the demon. The senior monk points out that to them, harming humans is a serious offense, and Jinka agrees based on their judgment of good and evil. He voices that if they are so thirsty for blood, they should end each other till there are no humans left. Tama prevents him from completing his statement with a kick. She wants to know exactly why this demon is harming humans. 
The monks let them know that the main temple told them not to speak of the incident. From that interaction, Shinsuke can see that Jinka hates humans, even though his older sister likes them. His thoughts are interrupted when the demon emerges behind him from the bamboo forest and startles everyone. The senior monk orders Uhu to get Shinsuke from harm's way. The samurai notices that the monster can speak, but a kick from the giant monk sends him to the duo. The Dengesu try to bind it with their powers, but Jinka notes that their spiritual level is not strong enough to take out the demon. This this is demonstrated when the demon breaks their restraints, so Tama orders her younger brother to help the monks out. Shinsuke watches in awe again, as Jinka dodges and deflects the monster's attacks. Tama asks the samurai if he's having second thoughts about getting involved with them. She tells him that the world they dwell in is one of darkness, as Jinka pins down the creature with his earth talismans. Shinsuke decides that this world of darkness is the place where he can become strong enough to beat anyone. Jinka swiftly dodges the creature's attack and jets out of the cloud of dirt holding an unconscious Uhu and Inga. Shinsuke, whom we will now be referring to as Shin, is impressed with his speed as he runs past him. His attention is drawn when the shadow of the monster looms over him. Tama and Jinka are already down the road escaping as she warns him not to get left behind. He kicks it into high gears and follows them. Jinka's summoned hand that was pinning the demon down soon disappears, allowing it to get back up. The group runs till the evening when they find a hut to hide in. Shin can't believe that Jinka ran that distance while holding the two monks. Tama states that he's beyond most humans. She nonchalantly drops that he was trained by Kokugetsusai as she wonders what kind of training he underwent. The Dangaisu are stunned to hear that he's an apprentice of Kokugetsusai. Shin doesn't understand the importance of this, so Inga explains that his master is a sage renowned for his martial prowess. The guy is known for defeating countless wicked sages and spirits. No one has ever fought him and lived. This feat earned him the title of Phoenix Killer. Jinka reveals that Kokugetsusai is the one who raised him so naturally he trained him too. Tama gets to work and uses the fact that Jinka saved their lives to get the Dangaisu to disclose everything they know about the demon named Shakugan. Inga begins by revealing that Shakugan is a spiritually enhanced human. She is an experimental super soldier created at the Dangaisu main temple. Their group has been trying to turn humans into demons to bolster their combat strength. They used farmers with spiritual potential in their experiments. However, Shakugan went berserk during the procedure and escaped. She returned to her home village and annihilated everyone. Uhu presumes that it was revenge for all the prejudice and maltreatment she faced while living there. The villagers' bodies were so badly disfigured that it was impossible to identify them. They are positive that she's lingering around to make sure that there are no survivors. Shin shakes with anger hearing that the monks are also treating farmers like toilet paper, just like the samurai. Judging from his reaction, Tama guesses that he's from a farming family. The guy cries when he remembers the suffering his village underwent at the hands of the samurai. This led him to believe that one gets oppressed when one is weak, so being strong is important. Uhu gets him even angrier when he says that they were trying to help Shakugan since she was an outcast. Tama kicks him when he starts getting too emotional. She informs everyone that she and Jinka will take care of it. The monks try to protest this, but she points out how they were not strong enough to defeat her, and if they call reinforcements, they will only increase their injured. Inga agrees and steps down. Jinka informs Shin that he will knock some sense into the creature when he worries about Shakugan getting eliminated. The two step out and complete their spirit transformation. Inga is shocked that Jinka knows his master's secret technique. Shakugan has finally arrived after tracking them down. The sage steps up and has a few intense clashes with the demon. The creature gets the upper hand when it knocks him into the air. The monks are in disbelief to see Shakugan fire a Gushinton blast because this is a Dangesu secret technique. Jinka recovers when Tama calls to him and he counters with a giant fist that breaks through the demon's attack and lands with devastating force. It knocks Shakugan back into her human form. The monks want to take her when it's confirmed that she's still alive. Shin is having none of it and stands between them with his blade drawn. Inga suggests they head back to HQ and points to Jinka as the main reason for standing down, because they simply can't face him. As they leave, Jinka releases the transformation, but Tama informs the Dengesu that they are guilty and need to be punished for their unethical actions. She demands they show them their main temple so that they can come and dish out the verdict of pain. The monks are taken aback and inform him that there are 300 Dangaisu at the main temple. Jinka confesses that he was going to attack the temple even if Tama didn't call them out. He already dislikes them, so slapping around 300 should be therapeutic. Inga asks them to question Shakugan about it if they are serious about coming, but he warns them that next time they meet, they should expect to face the monks' full power. 
Shin is the only gentleman around as he uses his top to cover Shakugan. He can't believe the two of them just challenge an army of warrior monks. The trio head to an inn where they allow the girl to rest. She regains consciousness, and everyone does a wellness check on her before they ask any further questions. Shakugan wants to know if the experimentation is over. The trio realizes that she doesn't have any recollection of what happened after arriving at the temple. The three introduce themselves before she begins to explain how her father sold her to the Dangesu. They offered a place for her to belong. She remembers being put to sleep at the temple and just waking up now. Jinka doesn't read the room and starts trying to explain what happened when she was unconscious, but the Ronin stops him. Tama checks her temperature, and she assures her that she doesn't need to worry anymore. Shakugan deduces that she caused some trouble for them and apologizes, but Tama tells her not to worry. Shin heads out to cut wood to take out some frustration. He is later joined by Tama, so he asks her what she thinks they do to turn a human into a demon, but she also doesn't know. After resting a little, the group heads out to the temple and are led by Shakugan. After trekking through the mountain, they arrive at the location of the Dangaisu. Tama informs Jinka that their goal is to make them understand that the experimentation is unethical. The fox spirit informs Shakugan and Shin to stay with her and observe things from a safe distance. Jinka pleads with Tama to give him a little bit more power for this fight, so they go somewhere hidden where they complete the transformation. She comes out blushing and Shakugan remarks on it and the change to her hair, all the while Jinka busts through the front door and is met with an army of monks. Inga orders the monks to attack, which they do piercing Jinka, but it turns out to be a paper decoy. He counters with a powerful blow that takes a lot of them out. The sage rushes to finish Inga, but a bunch of monks come together to fire a Gushinton at point-blank range. The explosion is seen by the other three. Shin worriedly asks Tama if everything is going to be okay. Back at the temple, the cloud of dust covers the area, but Inga assumes that Jinka has been eliminated by that attack. They are shocked to see him emerge through that dust with the giant hand he used to block. The sage counters with a devastating hit that takes out the monks that were guarding the gate and proceeds forward. Inga admits that Jinka lives up to his master's reputation, but he wonders how long his spiritual power is going to last. Back at the vantage point, Tama notes that the rumbling has stopped, so she guesses that he must have cleared the temple and entered the woods. Shin is confused as to why she has human ears in addition to her demon ones. She explains that the demon ears act as a reminder so that she doesn't forget who she truly is. Otherwise, she would be a demon with amnesia. Tama also discloses that she can hear out of both sets, which probably explains her good hearing. Shin wants to know if Jinka turns into a demon if he continues to use the spirit transformation. Tama explains that he wouldn't, because it's an incomplete technique that stops one step short of making him able to permanently become a demon. All the while, Jinka is confronted by Yezen, one of the leaders of the Dangaisu. His subordinates point to Jinka as the troublemaker. The old man is not impressed that the main temple allowed a child to have a tantrum through their grounds. One of the monks points out that regional branches have more combat experience than the monks in the main temple. Yezen moves to the laboratory and leaves Jinka to one of the monks. The sage can tell that there is something different about the leader as he walks away and gives him the bombastic side eye. He's left alone with the other monk who is confident that this fight will end differently than the one he had at the main gate. He reveals himself to be a spiritually enhanced human when he transforms. The monk dashes towards the sage and apprehends and tries to smother him. Jinka counters and summons some branches that perform the perfect reverse Uno. Inga and Uhu catch up and notice his heavy breathing. The duo is surprised that he came all this way to exact his notion of justice. The senior monk admits that the spiritual enhancement experiments are not pleasant, but he doesn't think that it is any of Jinka's concerns. Inga warns him that even if he does succeed, he will be hunted for the rest of his life. Jinka knows that he's having this long talk to give time for reinforcements to arrive. The sage decides to entertain them and reveals he's come for their research papers so that he can complete his master's secret technique. His goal is to cast away his humanity and become a demon. The two monks are shocked to hear this because he's already a monster at his current level. Jinka takes this comment as a compliment and heads off to his next target. After listening to him, Uhu believes that Tama is saner than him. The sage worries if he has enough spirit power left to finish the job as he arrives at the lab. He spots Yezen who gives him a provoking smile. Jinka returns it and jumps towards him to attack. The castle suddenly transforms and punches him into the mountain. The impact can be seen by the trio, and Tama's power returns to her which confuses everyone. She tells them that Jinka's spirit transformation has come undone, meaning he's either unconscious or dead. Their conversation is interrupted by a monk who transforms into a demon bear. He tells them that he's been ordered to retrieve Shakugan and eliminate Shin and Tama. Seeing the enhanced human causes Shakugan's memories of what she did while she was a demon 
demon to come flooding into her mind. All the while, Shin decides to beg for his life dramatically to allow the girls to escape, but they don't take the cue as the bear prepares to finish off the ronin. Shakugan's hand transforms because she's not able to control it, so she warns Shin to get out of the way before hitting the monk and knocking him out. She tells them that she remembers everything and runs away in a distressed state as Shin tries to comfort her. The ronin follows her, which reminds Tama of the moments she spent with Genzu on his deathbed. The old man gave her a letter to be given to Kokugetsusai. The fox spirit pled for the old man not to pass away. During that interim, Jinka gets a flashback to how a companion demon was eliminated by humans during a war. This is where his dislike for humans comes from. He wakes up just as he prepared to end a human survivor. The sage finds himself in a puddle of water with his staff upright. As he processes the dream, Yezen interrupts and is happy that he came to see if he was alive or not. The leader is impressed that he took a blow from Taizen and survived. Jinka turns to see that he's projecting his voice through a shikigami made from cloth. The leader reveals that Taizen is the name of the castle and manifests himself, and Jinka recognizes him. This leaves the leader with no other choice but to send an assassin to silence him. Yezen assures him that the person he's to send will be formidable when Jinka tries to dismiss the threat. The leader asks of Kokugetsusai, and Jinka informs him that his master passed away. Yezen disappears after confirming this. While the sage tries to find his way back to his allies, Shin anxiously searches for Shakugan. He eventually tumbles down and lands at her location, she tries to run away, but he gets her to stop and assures her that she's not a monster. Well, I beg to differ because my god, look at that monstrous hand. She doubles down that she is. He tells her that she wasn't in control while in that form, but she informs him that she wanted the power that Yezen offered to her. He comforts her that there is nothing wrong with wanting power. Before he can finish, his footing gives way, causing him to fall down the cliff. Tama joins him as he recovers and uses her hearing to help locate her. Shin subdues her just as she bumps into Jinka. He cries as he assures Shakugan that it's okay that she gained this power. They hold each other as they weep. Tama uses this moment to prove to Jinka that humans can be compassionate, and not all of them are bad. They each get a flashback to the painful moments in their past. The fox spirit tells Jinka to use his power to protect everyone, since they are now a party. Meanwhile, in Kyoto, a swordman is given the job to hunt down the group by a monk. Meanwhile, Shin and Jinka do some sparring, but it ends quickly when the sage parries the ronin's attack and counters with a head hit. Jinka comments on how weak, slow, and stupid Shin is, but the guy wants him to be more constructive and less insulting. Tama breaks up their little sparring session to present Shakugan in her new outfit. The lady comes out and is a little embarrassed at first. The spirit fox encourages her to transform her arms, which she does, and is happy to see her new fit doesn't interrupt her transformation. Shin is a little terrified, but Jinka finds it to be so cool as he blushes. The quartet later sit together, and Jinka reveals that the house they are currently living in was where Kokugetsusai raised him. When his master passed away, he was there alone till he met Tama, and now Shin and Shakugan have joined them. The guy wonders if there will ever be a time when he feels comfortable with their presence. They are soon joined by a friendly demon that informs them of a bad acting demon that demands sacrifices but doesn't protect the village. Tama and Jinka head to the village leaving the other two to complete some house chores. Shakugan bails on Shin to pick some vegetables leaving the guy to do everything. Back at the village, the arrival of the two brings everyone out. Tama confuses the residents when she informs them that they don't require any compensation for dealing with the demon. All she wants is for them to help spread this kindness among humanity. Given the era that they are living in, some of them think that she's stupid for having such ideologies. A boy is tasked with leading them to the lair of the demon. While on their way, Tama wants Jinka's opinion on her plan to spread kindness. The guy honestly informs her that it will take a thousand years to achieve world peace if she wants humans to simply pay kindness forward. The fox spirit will see it as a success, even if it takes a thousand years. Jinka internally wonders how long she's going to keep this up. The boy suddenly stops and begins to criticize the duo for not coming sooner because the demon who is named Guragura Gura ate his mother the previous day. He turns to them hoping that the demon eats them too. This behavior confirms Jinka's opinion that humans are selfish. He's surprised to see Tama bluntly correct the kids' ungratefulness with a few Will Smith special. They finally arrive at the lake where Guragura Gura calls home. The fox spirit confronts him and learns that they make the sacrifices in exchange for him not destroying the village. He disregards Tama's protest and attacks them, 
but Jinka transforms and moves everyone out of harm's way. The sage is annoyed that he dared to attack Tama. He senses Jinka's spirit energy and decides to bring out a lady he didn't digest to use as his captive. The boy recognizes her as his mother and pleads for Gura Gura to take him instead. The boy's selflessness touches Jinka, who was just about to attack with little regard for the lady. The situation is de-escalated when Zanzu comes in and instantly cuts down Gura Gura. The guy identifies Jinka, leading Tama to guess that he's an assassin sent by the Dengaisu. He takes the mother and son as his captives to force Jinka to fight him, and the sage reluctantly agrees. They proceed to a better location to fight, but before they begin, Tama demands to know the name of the one challenging them. Zanzu adds that he's a darkness eater. He defeats demons and sells their parts as food. The duo is shocked to hear that there are people who eat demon meat. Hearing this triggers Jinka, the sage uses some elemental attacks, but the assassin blocks and evades them all using his sorceress sword. Jinka senses a high round of spiritual power coming from the blade. They pause after having a few more exchanges. Zanzu can see that his sorceress sword can't defeat Jinka, so he changes to his shorter blade. The sage is confused because he doesn't sense any spiritual power coming from it. The assassin plans to show him how terrifying humans can be. He quickly overwhelms Jinka and ends the battle by stopping the blade at the sage's neck. He informs Jinka that he spared him because he doesn't look appetizing and he doesn't end things he doesn't intend to eat. He condescendingly tells the sage that he gets to live another day. The assassin calls Tama a naughty fox as he advises her to talk some sense into Jinka. As Zanzu leaves, the mother and son thank him, and they also express their gratitude to the duo. Jinka excuses himself, feeling like he doesn't deserve their thanks because he wanted to abandon them, but the fox is happy that he didn't. What pains Jinka more is that he lost to a human, Later that night, Zanzu grills up a part of the demon and finds it disgusting. As he complains about not being able to sell it, a monk stealthily joins him and orders him to fight Jinka again, but to the death this time. He reminds Zanzu that they have his sister. The following morning, Shin complained about his back from doing all the house chores. Jinka has already left the room and sits at the edge of the river thinking about his battle with Zanzu. He gets startled when Shakugan comes to inform him that the food is ready. Their conversation is interrupted by the monk who issues him an official deathmatch challenge from Zanzu. He warns Jinka that if he flees, the Yamato family will be crushed. The sage tells him that he doesn't care what happens to that family. The monk asks him to think over it before leaving. That evening, Tama reveals that Jinka comes from the Yamato family, but was adopted by Kokugetsusai shortly after his birth. They abandon him so he doesn't care what happens to them. He heads back out to mentally prepare for the fight, he is determined to find a way to win. The following day, the duo meet up with their witnesses. Jinka decides to use a dagger this time around, but from their first clash, he realizes that he has made a mistake when he's disarmed with a stab to his arm. His life flashes before his eyes as the assassin prepares to end him, but he rejects death so attacks himself in addition to Zanzu. He unlocks a new level of resolve because he was pushed to the brink. The sage gets up ready to fight, but Zanzu is unable to inform him that the fight is over. The sage lets out a menacing laugh as Tama falls to the floor out of relief. The assassin asks Jinka to finish him off, but the sage spares him in the same manner he did earlier. The rest of the gang rush to congratulate him on his win. All the while, the monk informs Zanzu that his sister Hino has volunteered to be the next assassin if he gets defeated, so he should forget about his sister as she abandoned her humanity to become a war demon. A couple of days after the fight, Jinka and Tama follow Shin as he suspiciously walks through the forest clutching something. He arrives at a cave, and the two feel like he should be more aware of his surroundings. The ronin calls into the cave that he has brought some rice balls. The siblings are shocked to see a bandage up Zanzu emerge from the opening. Jinka speculates that the deal is that Shin brings food for sword instruction. This is evident as Zanzu munches on his food while watching the bootleg samurai swing. The master notes that Shin has a good downward swing and gives him instruction to improve his side sweep. The lad has a significant improvement after following the steps. Jinka interrupts when he realizes that Shin is giving the swordsmen their pantry food. The guy is surprised to see them, but Zenzu is more amazed that he didn't notice them. After explaining the situation, they take Zenzu to their home for better treatment. While Shakugan prepares some medicine, he reveals that the Dangaisu threatened to harm his sister to force him to attack them. He belongs to the Raidu clan, which has no standing in terms of class. However, they are strong spiritually. These powers tend to draw demons to them, so they prefer to stay away from the center of attention. However, they must make a living, so he became a darkness eater, 
while his sister became a nun in the Dangaisu. Her spiritual power was average compared to the rest of the organization. This was what led him to believe that the leaders could have ended her at any time if they wanted. He takes a sip of the medication and accidentally spits it in Shin's face because it tastes so bad. The guy rolls around in agony, and Jinka enjoys the sight. Zenzu gets back on topic that his sister rose through the ranks and is now known as Higan one of the four beast leaders. She is going to be the next assassin that Jinka is going to face. He simply wants the sage to be careful. Jinka reminds Zenzu of the L he just took which almost ended his life. He can't guarantee that his sister will be so lucky. Tama remarks that the name Haigen, which means icy rock, has the same naming scheme as Shakugan. So they conclude that his sister is spiritually enhanced. Their conversation is broken when a friendly demon comes in injured. He informs them that a hostile lady kicked him out of his home and told him to inform Jinka that she's waiting. The sage gets up to face his new foe, and he's followed by Tama, Zenzu, and Shakugan. Shin is told to stay back and tend to the injured demon. After a short trek, they arrive at a temple where Hino waits. She is happy to see her brother alive. He's kind of happy that she has made something of herself. Jinka hits his staff against the ground, putting an end to the sibling reunion. Tama can see that he's agitated, so she warns him to stay calm when fighting. Jinka transforms and so does Hino. The lady's legs turn into a giant hand. She intends to use this power to increase the standing of the Raidu clan. Shakugan steps forward and addresses Hino as Sogan, since she recognizes that scent. It is revealed that spiritually enhanced humans have had demons sealed inside of them, like on some Naruto level sh**. This is what gives the humans their powers. The demon inside Shakugan is called Kagan, and the one inside Hino is Sogan. Jinka gets annoyed at this revelation and prepares to attack Hino. However, Shakugan decides to fight herself when Hino calls her defective for living in harmony with her inner demon. The two have an intense clash, but Jinka believes that Shakugan has the advantage since they are in harmony. All the while, Shin tends to the injured tree demon by feeding it dirt to replenish its strength. The demon advises him to be nice to Jinka, as he's someone who treats his friends well. The guy is already aware of this. Shin heads out to get more dirt rich in worms when he feels a sudden cold sensation. He looks up and is confronted by Janoon, the crusty feet Mofo and Senya, who move along when they confirm that their target is not around. Shin looks into Senya's eyes and sees a river of red residue. He falls to the floor terrified. The tree demon comes out stating that he just smelt a dragon. He tells Shin to take the shortcut and inform Jinka and the others to evacuate. You know, this treeman is kinda sorta the bootleg version of Hoko from Hell's Paradise, who is the bootleg version of Groot. And you're the bootleg version of me. The battle pauses when he arrives and tells them that a dragon is on the way, the sage is terrified, and Hino knows that it's Jinun. Jinka orders everyone to run, but he's too late. The dragon reveals that he has come to eliminate Hino, because she assassinated a high-ranking shogunate official. Jinun transforms into his dragon form and moves at a blistering speed, landing a devastating blow on Hino. This sends the lady flying into the temple. He reverts to normal as he turns his attention to Jinka for attacking the main temple. The sage grabs Tama and activates a smoke shield. He informs everyone to meet at Zenzu's cave. Senya attacks some decoys, thinking that they are their enemies, but Jinun points out his mistake. The dragon reveals that they have all escaped, but he's certain that Hino doesn't have long to live. Everyone makes it to the cave. Hino confesses that she did commit the crime, but it was under Matsunaga's orders. Zenzu is confused because the Dangesu are forbidden to use their powers to influence public affairs, but she informs him that her only goal was elevating their family. Wait a minute. Janoon the crusty feet dragon turned our girl into Geodude with zero remorse. Jinka finishes her off when she tries to escape. Shakugan is a little upset to lose a friend in such a manner and wonders why humans and demons can't live in peace. But why does her corpse look like sugar cubes made out of concrete? Jinka doesn't want to face Janoon because he's too powerful, but Tama informs him that they can't run forever. Even if they deal with the other assassins, they will have to face him their only chance of survival is to defeat him. They will prepare by first finding the Dangesu laboratory and putting an end to their cruel studies on demons. They will then take that research and gather the information needed to fight the dragon, and then they will use what they have learned to buy time until they are ready to face him. Shakugan wants to take her old friend's remains back home, 
and Tama feels like they should start with that, Zenzu decides to stay back to clean up after his sister. Everyone can be seen making their next move. As they proceed through the forest, Shin walks with a smugness about himself, so Tama and Jinka tease him for it. The aspiring samurai recalls receiving the sorceress sword named Arabuki from Zenzu. The ronin explained that it uses spiritual power to control wind and has been passed down through the Raidu family for generations. Zenzu intended to go serve Lord Yoshiteru to atone for his sister's mistake. The Lord is a pure sword master, so Zenzu didn't want to wield a blade from the world of darkness in his presence. As he gave the blade to Shin, he pled for the lad to make sure that Jinun didn't get away with his actions. Jinka ruins the moment by bluntly stating that Shin can't defeat Jinun. The trainee blasts the sage for being so disrespectful when Zenzu is vulnerable and promises to make Jinun regret it. Presently, Shin feels stronger just carrying the blade around and goes to draw it despite Jinka's advice. He is one sword and a hair dye away from being Zoro. The wind from the blade blows him away, urging the sage to reveal that it's because Shin doesn't have any real spiritual strength. Tama informs him that just carrying the sword around gives him the benefits of its spiritual power. This setback has deflated his confidence once again. The group takes a break and Shakugan informs everyone that they are getting closer to Kagan's home. Shin only wants to figure out how to use the blade before they fight Jinun. Shakugan believes he can do it which makes him feel better. Tama interjects when she smells a group of shuju in the area and rushes off to find them. She gets excited when they confirm that they are carrying happy juice and tries to trade some daikon radishes for a jar. They reject the offer and inform her that it's for their guest. The fox spirit orders them to lead the way. Tama reveals that the happy juice from the shuju is the best. After a short walk, they arrive at the location where Doran enjoys the earlier batch. The demon monkey presents the group and their intention to drink some of the tipsy juice. They note how big Doran is when he stands and feels like he might be bigger than Janoon. He overhears them and is surprised that they know the dragon. Upon closer inspection, he figures that they are the ones who attacked the main temple based on their description given to him. The party gets on guard when they realize that he's a Dungaishu. The monk confirms that he's Doran the Tiger, one of the four beast leaders of the organization. He quickly assures them that he's not a threat currently because he has not been tasked with subjugating them. However, he can't ignore them given his position, so Tama takes the opportunity to turn the potential hostile encounter into a drinking contest. If they win, he must let them go. Durin loves that idea, so he agrees. Jinka is a lightweight and faints after a single cup, which shocks everyone. As they continue, the monk reveals that he's in the area dealing with a tiger demon that has been threatening the mountain. It was so strong that he was forced to flee into the woods. He further details how he defeated it with the aid of the shuju and their tipsy juice. They continue to drink till the evening, and Tama wants to know the weakness of Janun. He tells them that they are wasting their time if they intend to defeat the Dragon Man, because he's the one who's going to defeat him. Doran discloses that the two are rivals from the same town. He joined the organization to follow Jinun. Tama consents that Doran is a spiritually enhanced human with a powerful demon inside of him. The monk prefers not to talk about that now and changes the topic to her ability to hold her juice. This triggers a memory of being taught by Genzu, so it only makes her want to win more. Unfortunately, night falls and Tama and Shin are unconscious leaving Shakugan as the last one standing. Durin can see that she has no signs of slowing down and concedes to her. As he bows his head in defeat, she orders the monkeys to bring more juice for her. The following morning the group wakes up to find the monk sleeping. When they prepare to leave, Durin regains consciousness and informs Jinka that they didn't talk much, but the next time they will have a discussion with their fists, so he shouldn't let the next assassin called Reshin beat him. The party proceeds forward and arrives at a village that is sealed off with a powerful barrier. Jinka opens a part of the barrier for Tama to enter so that she can investigate. She meets a spirit named Fuko, who claims to be the protector of the town. It was created from the worries of the people's need to preserve their good times since they didn't know what the future was going to bring. The spirit uses its ability to find out about the demise of Genzu and promises to keep her safe. Meanwhile, the others are confronted by Reshin also, a member of the four beast leaders. He comes to deal with them for their attack on the main temple. Jinka steps forward and is confident that he can defeat him without Tama's power. Reshin draws a gladiator-style blade from a special cursed sack given to him by Yazan. Back in the village, Tama realizes that the villagers met their demise due to being cut off from the rest of the world. The spirit did its job too well. Tama hugs Fuko and thanks it for all it has done. This prompts a rush of emotion because it is the first time it has been thanked. It also allows it to let go and move on to the next world. 
Dispelling the barrier, Jinka gets distracted by it and is knocked back by Reshin. The sage returns transformed and counters with a powerful punch that sends the beast leader flying. Tama explains the fate of the village as they pass through. The party later reaches an area where they are hosted by some earth-type demons. While Shin plays with the heavy rock children, Tama comments on the way he's naturally interacting with the rock demons. She points out to Jinka that this shows that humans and demons can live in harmony, so there is no need for him to want to turn into a demon. He later takes a walk thinking about the discussion and reveals that he wants to be a demon so that he can protect Tama forever. The want-to-be demon spots a struggling pregnant lady traveling solo. He quickly gets the other to help bring her to safety. They explain the situation to the leader of the rock demons who permitted her to stay till the child is born. All the while, Janoon and Durin meet up with Yazin. The dragon guy gives an update on Senya's progress. After the informal meeting, Yazin gives Durin the order to subjugate Jinka. That night in the mountains, Shakugan interrupts Shin while he trains to inform him that the Rock Elder is complaining that he's making too much noise. She also notices that he has blisters on his hands from training. He comments that the weak don't have the right to live, which is why he must get stronger. He also doesn't feel like he's contributing to the party since they started the journey. Shakugan points out the moment he consoled her when she was depressed about her powers. The lady blushes and runs away. Her inner demon Kagan takes control of her body. It instructs Shin to draw the sorceress sword and gives him some pointers as thanks for the concern he has shown for them. The guy does so and is blown back. Kagan notes that he's not communicating with the sword. He advises him to think of the blade as a person. The lad guesses that the blade has not acknowledged him yet. He recalls how it is like the situation in which he learned to use a sword. He was interacting with a samurai ghost who advised him to spend every spare moment practicing his swing. Kagan now understands why only his downward strike is decent. Kagan now understands why only his downward strike is decent. Shakuyaku is actually the real name of the body the demon is hosting. She is only called Shakugan because it is a combination of the name Shakuyaku and Kagan. The demon inside Shakuyaku advises him to keep working to become the kind of man worthy of her. It wants him to marry her one day, and the lady quickly takes over and runs away blushing. This also gets Shin a little hyped to try harder. Tama and Jinka heard everything and just wanted to get some rest. The next day, they all come to check on the pregnant woman. Shakugan is surprised when the lady decides to name the child Shakuyaku if it's a girl. Jinka suggests the name Kagan if it's a boy. The woman loves both names, and Shakugan is moved by the gesture. The sage finally gathers the courage to interact with the unborn babies, but the woman goes into labor which gets everyone on high alert. Unfortunately, Doran and Reshin arrive at the location, and they inform the elder that they are on a manhunt when asked. As the tiger explains the situation to the rock boss, he discreetly orders his subordinates to inform the party about the impending danger. Reshin knows they are around because he used his remote viewing to locate them. He threatens to cause mayhem to find their targets. Doran doesn't think that will be necessary because Shin, Shakugan, and Jinka have already arrived. The tiger recognizes the sage's spirit transformation. The only way for them to protect the mother and child is to fight. Shin is willing to use his new blade if the situation gets dire. Durin is ready for the fist conversation, so he asks Reshin to stay out of this fight. He turns his attention to finding out why Tama is not around, and Durin also transforms into his tiger form. He knocks Jinka back with a flurry of punches and reveals that it's an uncommon boxing technique. The sage gets annoyed that he has been damaged by a human technique and attacks with a barrage of his moves, but Durin blocks them all. The fight intensifies as the two trade blows and they both laugh in a manic manner. Shin watches knowing that what he's witnessing is what it means to be strong. Shakugan and Shin's attention is drawn by Reshin. He has figured that they are hiding something behind a rock opening. Shakugan attacks him, but it is a Shikigami that disappears. He triggers a boulder to explode. Jinka is distracted when he sees the talismans on the rock, giving Doran the opportunity to land a clean hit that sends him crashing into the wall. Back in the protected area, the lady struggles to get the baby out. Shakugan refuses to allow the rolling boulder to reach its destination and stops it. The others are shocked. Doran looks to Jinka, and he's knocked out cold. Shakugan orders Shin to head to the hut, but clones of Reshin make him pause for a moment. Doran attacks him for interfering, which makes Shin to realize that it's an illusion. As he runs through the paper clones, the real Reshin attacks Shakugan with a fatal blow. Shin tries to retaliate with his new blade, but is blown back by some talismans. Shakugan sacrifices herself, stating she loves everyone and turns into a boulder to stop the bigger one. The talismans powering it disappear to indicate that it has stopped. The tiger prevents Reshin from finishing off Jinka while he's down. He apologizes to the sage for Reshin's interruption when he regains consciousness. Durin hopes that the next time they meet it can be an all-out battle. 
As they leave, Jinka looks for Shakugan, but the lad points to the smaller boulder. Tama comes out to inform the two that the lady has given birth to twins. They all cry because one is a girl called Shakuyaku and the boy is Kagan, which is in memory of their fallen companions. Shin bites his lip and leaves. He faces the boulder outside and continues the lip biting. The rock demon informs the trio that they will escort the mother to her village when she's back on her feet. The lady doesn't want to ask what happened, but she just wishes that Shakugan could have held the kids. As the party leaves, Elder Dagon tries to console them by disclosing that Shakugan is still alive and entered a deep sleep because she used too much spiritual energy. When she will awaken is unknown, Jinka also brings up the possibility of her not waking at all. Whatever the case, she is now one with the land. The trio later rests after a long travel, and Shin is looking rough while assuring his sword that he will give it plenty of red residue soon. It also wants him to give it back to Zanzu because he's not worthy. The other two think that his conversations with the blade are all made up. They are soon joined by Kagamori, the demon who guards the village nearby, after confirming that they are not bandits. He instructs them to use the hut on the other side of the river. They move over there and sit in silence. Tama can see that Shakugan's demise has affected the boys, but Shin is hit hardest and is consumed by rage. Their quiet is disrupted when they hear a young boy complaining to his older sister because she has been chosen to be the next sacrifice for Kagamori. She explains that in exchange for protection from bandits or battle, someone must meet their demise every four years. The boy run off not wanting to understand, Shin gets up to go exterminate the demon, but Tama thinks that a sacrifice once every four years for protection is reasonable. Plus, he's in no position to object. Hearing this infuriates Shin and he grabs the fox stating that it's not acceptable. Jinka kicks him off her and warns him not to address her in such a manner. He still tries to leave but Tama throws a snake at him, but a shout dispels the illusion. She catches up and gives him some gear that the Elder Daigon gave them. He apologizes to her for his actions and takes it. She doesn't want to lose him too. He tracks down the demon and calls to it. Kagamori pops out of the trees but he's suddenly stabbed by Reshin. The beast leader steps out teasing Shin which enrages him, causing him to charge. They briefly clash and Reshin hits Shin back with an attack knocking him out. While the beast leader prepares to finish him off, Shin enters the mental realm of the sorceress blade Arakuki. It demands he allow it to take control of his body, but Shin rejects the offer and rather forcibly takes control of the blade. He regains consciousness and swiftly cuts Reshin's hand, but is even more surprised that he regenerates it. The beast leader gets annoyed and removes his head covering to reveal a heavily modified face, which he fires a blast from. The Ronin narrowly dodges and is also knocked back by a barrage of blades. Arakuki alerts him that rage won't make his blade stronger. Shin doesn't heed the warning and continues to charge, but he's disarmed. He thinks fast and lands a punch on Reshin, and repeatedly beats him. But the beast leader gets him off with another mouth shot. Kagamori uses the last of his energy to incapacitate Reshin before meeting his demise. Shin has an internal conflict on ending Reshin while he's down, but a vision of Shakugan calms him down. Yazan interferes through a Shikigami and asks Shin not to end his subordinate as he cost him a lot of money and effort to make. He orders Reshin to head back to HQ when he regains consciousness. Before he leaves, both he and Shin warn each other that their fight is not over. That evening as he passes through the village, one of the residents who thinks he defeated Kagamori complains about how they wouldn't be able to defend themselves now that their guardian is gone. The Ronin blasts him for being weak and alerts him that their fate is to meet their demise if they don't get stronger. Tama and Jinka wait for him at the edge of the village because they must leave due to his actions. The boy and his sister thank them as they leave. That night, Jinka and Shin argue, but Tama puts an end to it. Later, as the other two sleep, Shin practices his swing wanting to get stronger. After a couple of more days of traveling, they reach a pass and wonder if they took the wrong turn. Jinka suddenly feels an intense spirit power, just as they are joined by two huge Tengu. The mountain goddess follows saying that Elder Dagon told her about how they are opposing the Dangesu. Due to this, she's on their side. They find this whole situation abrupt, but they follow her. She informs them of who she is, and she takes them somewhere where they relax because Janun is on their tail. Tama is not surprised that he has been unleashed since the other three beast leaders have failed to bring them down. The trio worries about her leaving the Tengu behind at the pass, but the mountain goddess hopes that Jinka can tell from his fairy eyes that she doesn't need them to guard her. Jinka has never heard of those kind of eyes before which doesn't surprise the goddess since his have been sealed. They proceed to a cave that has giant pillars of crystals that illuminate the space, 
The goddess thanks them for trusting her because Janoon will not be able to reach them. She jumps to the highest crystal and instructs them to follow so that they can have a chat. Meanwhile, Janoon and Senya arrive at the entrance but are refused entry by the Tengu. The dragon orders Senya to deal with them, which he does swiftly, opening up the path for them to proceed. Janoon gives him some feedback on his performance, but that is suspended when the bodies of the Tengu turn to birds. They cast a spell that will ensure the duo stay lost when they enter the forest. Back in the cave, the goddess reveals that she's an old friend of Elder Dagon, and they keep in communication through a stone. After hearing from him she wanted to be friends with them, Tama is not so naive and would like to know what she wants from them. They are already indebted to her for sheltering them from the dragon. The goddess admits that she wants them to wake up Taizan the castle, where the Dange Su do all their research. She reveals that Taizan is a lower-ranked mountain deity like her. However, the Dangaishu have brainwashed him into service. The trio gets a little scared when she informs them that all one must do is slap the mountain to wake him up. The goddess has been kept from pinpointing Taizan's location by the monk's field, so all she wants is for them to show her the way to allow her to knock some sense into him. This will also benefit the trio as one of the Dangaishu's three most powerful assets will be taken out. Jinka assumes that Janun the dragon is the second, and the goddess reveals that Kuzunoha is the last one. Tama's eyes widen after hearing that name. She wants to clarify that the goddess is referring to the fox. The deity explains how Kuzunoha fell in love with a monk who had an interest in enchanted weapons and spells when he and his unit were tasked with eliminating her. The man joined up with Kuzunoha to defeat and exterminate his unit using spirit transformation. This lovesick monk's name is Yazen, the current head priest of the organization. Tama blushes to hear the story and drops the bombshell that Kuzunoha is her mother, but assures them that Yazen is not her father as she's older than him. The monk got away with his actions by reporting that his unit defeated Kuzunoha at a heavy cost. Unbeknownst to the organization, he hides his new love and continues his research on how to turn a demon into a human. The spiritually enhanced humans are byproducts of his research. Shin gets dark as he states that the old man must lose his life. Tama agrees and is willing to defeat her romance-driven mother if need be. The crows return and pause the discussion for a moment. Rinzu drops down and lands on Shin's head. She reports on how Janun is currently meditating in the mountain's spiritual pocket in the hope of breaking the lost spell cast on them. She ignores Shin's request for an apology when she instantly falls in love with Jinka at first sight, but he's not interested because she's a human. The goddess reveals that Rinzu is a human she's raising as her apprentice. She changes the topic to Janun and shows him meditating using her powers. The lady tries to distract him, but he easily counters. She sends down messages to the creatures in the area to distract him. This will buy her time to train the three of them. She slows down time on them. The focus of this training was to unlock Jinka's fairy eyes and increase the other two's spiritual power. This exercise will also relax the group's subconscious assumptions. She informs them that they have no limit as she transports them to a different dimension. Shin is faced with a boulder. Tama stands in the middle of a lake, and Jinka's training starts with the goddess revealing that she indirectly trained his master Kokugetsusai. This was done by consistently defeating him when he tried to riz her up. So the goddess is his master's master, she informs him to fight Rinzu, and the girl is giving the incentive of Jinka, getting compelled to love her if she defeats him. She also discloses that he can't die in this space. This is shown when Rinzu takes his arm off when the fight begins. He is mortified at first, till he realizes that his hand is healed. He dodges her attacks while listening to the goddess's explanation of the fairy eyes. They endow those who have it with special spiritual powers, and they are always born as twins. Jinka is not surprised to hear this because he has been watching his brother live happily with their parents in the shadows. It is revealed that powerful demons are attracted to the area when twins with fairy eyes are together. That is why Jinka was given away at the suggestion of Kokugetsusai and taken into his custody. The mountain deity pleads with Jinka not to hate his master, parents, or his brother. The sage gets emotional wanting to know why it was him who got given away. He had to train hard while watching his brother play around looking so happy. He continues to dodge Rinzu's assault as the goddess reveals that fairy twins' lives are connected, so if one perishes, so does the other. She continues to outline all the sad things that Jinka has been through. The sage thinks about it all and agrees, but the reason why it pains him is that he wasn't unhappy through it all. This confession unseals his eyes, causing him to see the aura emanating from the goddess. 
she discloses that the trick to undoing the seal was for him to accept his existence and place in the world. He can see that the attack he was dodging didn't have much power in them. It also dawns on him that the source of human and demon power is the same. Meanwhile, Tama gets distracted by a clone of the goddess and falls into the water. Her training is to reach the shore by walking on the water. Back in the forest, Janun continues to dispel all the distractions and allows Senya to find and defeat Jinka. The dragon reminds the boy that he's the first spiritually enhanced human with over a thousand demons in his body, so he should prove himself worthy of the honor. While searching, he comes across a demon that gets scared and gives him a toy before running off. Things switch to Shin's training, and he thinks that he was to cut the boulder in front of him. He uses Arabuki's wind power to try and cut it, but fails. He next attempts to cut it using the actual blade which Arabuki protests against. After a few more attempts, he realizes the point of the training is to get past the giant rock, so he uses the blade's wind power to fly over it. The goddess congratulates him on being the first to pass. She drops him in the real world, and he lands on top of Senya as he holds his blade to the lad's neck. She encourages Shin to end the boy, reminding him that he's the dragon's apprentice, also, Senya possesses incredible potential as a spiritually enhanced human. The goddess remarks on how much of a miracle it is for the ronin to have him at his mercy, considering the gap in their power. She even goes as far as to call it a once-in-a-billion chance. Senya agrees that he should do it, prompting Shin to tell him to shut up. The deity continues to point out more reasons to eliminate the kid, because he will tear Shin to shreds if he lets him up, and that boy could turn out more dangerous than the dragon someday. She describes him as a potential demon god, given the number of creatures inside of him. Shin looks into his eyes and sees what she means. The ronin's tears shower Senya as he talks out how he's still a child that has been crammed full of monsters. He refuses to end the boy. Even his blade is shocked given how dangerous Senya is. The boy gets up, transforms his hand, and slams the ground next to Shin before breaking the toy and running off upset. The goddess labels Shin the wickedest man who let the future king of monsters survive. Meanwhile, Jinka stops Rinzu's punches with his bare hands and pleads for her to surrender. The lady does so immediately because she loves him. The goddess reveals that that was the only way he would have won this battle. The next step for the sage is to practice and suggest he fight Janun, and this confuses Jinka because he is sure that he would only win once out of 10,000. The goddess agrees but speculates if that one in thousand instance happened first, he would have won. She feels like he should give it a shot. She wants him to learn that he can encounter the dragon and survive. The goddess transports him before Janun, but he falls inside the river and washes downstream as the monk wonders if that was an illusion. All the while, Tama hears that the other two have completed their training, which only motivates her to do her best as she meditates. That night, the goddess talks to the two guys about the importance of them experiencing what a coincidence feels like. They are soon joined with Tama, who comments that it's been a while since she has seen them. With the last member's arrival, the goddess says that it's time for them to leave. She plans to trap the dragon on the mountain for a few days, while they mount an attack on the Dangesu main temple. This means that they will be facing the remaining beast leaders, Yazen and Kuzunoha, and they might have a chance of winning. Rinzu will be joining them for the infiltration. Tama pauses everyone for a moment. She feels like this is the best chance they will have to fight Janun. The goddess acknowledges their increase in spiritual power through her training, but she alerts them that they are nowhere near the dragon's class. Tama is aware of this, but has a plan. The deity gives them the go-ahead and is happy that two of them have experienced miracles, so they might pull this off if they take what they have experienced to heart. She allows them to stay in the cabin for the night before their big attack. She and Rinzu excuse themselves as they wish them good luck. Tama reveals her plan of creating a scenario where the mountain goddess will be forced to interfere. The battle plan is to attack but prioritize evasion. The next day comes and the trio hikes to Janun's location, but Jinka is prevented from transforming by Senya, who kicks him away and holds the other two captive, warning them not to interfere. The commotion catches the attention of the dragon who leaps to Jinka's location instantly. He introduces himself as the commander of the beast leaders. As he transforms, he states Jinka's crime of attacking the main temple and how it's left to him to carry out the judgment. Using his fairy eyes, the sage can see that Janun is on another level and he's paralyzed in fear. Luck is on his side because two instant death attacks from the dragon miss. Jinka laughs as he remembers the goddess saying, the one in a 10,000 chance could be this attempt. This gives the sage some confidence to create an opening for him to retrieve Tama and complete his transformation. Shin notices that he has a fifth tail now. Tama reveals that she cultivated her spirit power for 10 years during her training. 
Janoon asks him if he's still willing to struggle, knowing that it will mean a more painful demise. The sage is ready to fight. The dragon acknowledges his potential because with further training, he could reach Doran's level. Jinka uses his fifth tail, which is a blade to corner Janoon, so that he can unleash his ultimate attack. It combines all five elements to create a spirit ball. The dragon counters with his technique, and in the aftermath, both parties lose their arms. The goddess is impressed that the sage could draw against such a foe. Jinka refuses to bleed out till his foe meets his demise and unleashes a sixth lightning tail which surprises everyone. Janoon concludes that Jinka poses too much of a threat and leaps up in preparation to execute a deadly technique. The goddess interferes because she wants to maintain her mountain and nullifies them in an instant. She sinisterly informs the party that forcing her help is going to cost them while Janoon breaks out of his bond. The goddess warns the dragon that he will lose if he tries to oppose her, since her clone is still ten times stronger than him. Janoon still doesn't stand down and is pressed deep into the earth. Senya tries to intervene, but he too is caught. We learn that Janoon is his father when he shouts for him as they both get sealed by the goddess. The deity finally recognizes the two as members of the silver-haired clan. She tells them that she will imprison them at that location for now. She turns her attention to stopping Jinka's leaking with a seed. The goddess informs them that she will come for what she's owed at the end of the journey. Shin watches Jinka's missing arm and utters that he's still useless for not being able to help. The trio get back on the goddess's plan and journey with Rinzu to find Taizen. Meanwhile, word of Janun and Senya getting sealed by the mountain god reaches the Dangeshu HQ. Durin is alarmed to hear this but he gets excited that Jinka and Ko have leveled up significantly with the help of the goddess and are coming. Yazin is not comfortable that Janun and Senya are out of action at this crucial time. Doren sees it as a good chance to foster new strength, as relying on the father and son too much will backfire on the organization. The monk leader sees the point and feels like it will be a good time to utilize the new demon hybrid models. Doran excuses himself to prepare for their visitors. Yazin is sure the Beast Commander is going to end up clashing with the new models, who have named themselves the Ten Saints from the opening of heaven. Not before long, Yazin hears some rumbling and informs Kuzunoha that it's Doran and the Ten Saints fighting. The Demon Fox wonders who is stronger out of the two. The old man is sure that Doran is ahead of them in that regard. This is demonstrated when the Tiger takes out the new models with ease. During that interval, Jinka finally regains consciousness, and they inform him that they are in the next town. Shin asks him how his arm is feeling. He is a little confused at first and is reminded that he has lost it when he looks. He gives a sad expression for a moment, prompting Tama to start apologizing. Everyone is shocked when Jinka hugs her while laughing. He commends Tama because it is thanks to her plan that they managed to get rid of Janun. The sage thinks that subduing the dragon at the cost of an arm is worth it. He's even able to smile about it. Rinzu starts fangirling at his mental fortitude, but he can't even remember her name which causes her emotional damage. Shin doesn't think he and Tama can smile when another friend has gotten injured. The demon fox understands where he's coming from, but she suggests they try and smile since Jinka is already at peace with his situation. Shin has another emo moment saying that he doesn't have a right since he's weak, and the guy leaves to wallow alone. Jinka reveals to those remaining that he feels no pain nor any disturbance in his spirit power, even though he lost his arm. Rinzu reveals that it is thanks to the mountain goddess's treatment, the sage is sure that his capacity to fight has rather increased. His body still remembers how it left life to awaken his spirit power. After hearing this, Tama announces that they will be leaving the following day. The next morning, everyone waits for Jinka, who comes out revealing his new outfit. Rinzu compliments him, but Shin is not much of a fashionista and suggests they get moving. Rinzu halts everyone and tells them to write their names on some blank talismans. Tama is a little salty when the apprentice calls her big sister because it makes her sound old. Rinzu lets them know that she will use the talismans for soul calling, which is a difficult technique used to transport people and demons over great distances to wherever the spellcaster is. This will be an important precaution to have for the attack against the HQ in case they need an emergency evacuation. Jinka is a little skeptical that Rinzu can do it, but she demonstrates by summoning Kojiru the crow which shuts the sage up, they take a break before the hike to the main temple. Tama and Jinka warn Rinzu not to summon any demons, especially the ones who want to join the battle because of their dislike for the Dengaisu. This is a battle to reform the world, and not for vengeance. The group proceeds forward, and not before long, the main temple comes into view. Jinka and Tama excuse themselves to transform. While alone, Jinka expresses his wish to marry Tama after he turns himself into a demon with the research in the temple. Yazin is aware when the party enter the vicinity of the temple, 
This prompts him to ask Kuzunoha who the father of Tama is. The old man admits he's jealous. She promises to tell him if her daughter fights her way to them. The trio decide to go through the main gate, and they are greeted by Durin, who knew they would come through there. The other monks are guarding the different paths that get into the temple. He wastes no time and transforms. Jinka steps up, but he loses the first few exchanges. Durin seems to have evolved his fighting style and greatly improved his footwork. As the sage takes a beating, Reshin tries a sneak attack, but Shin intercepts, but it was a shikigami. The beast leader gestures for Shin to follow him since they have unfinished business. Tama tells him to shout for the soul calling if he gets in trouble. Meanwhile, the old couple watch the main fight from a distance, and Yazen is confident that Doran will win, because in terms of martial might, he's the strongest in the organization. Tama is sure that Jinka is taking the W. The sage tries to attack with his lightning sixth tail, but the tiger lands a punch before he can unleash the attack. The tiger acknowledges that Jinka has more spiritual power than him, but he has been training to beat a rival under the same circumstances. The sage can't believe that he's struggling to keep up despite powering up. He can see that Durin is far beyond him. This means he needs to awaken a miracle, so he attacks the tiger with all his elements. Things switch to Shin, who is being led to a cave by repeatedly cutting down Shikigamis. Arabuki gets annoyed and demands blood. He enters the cave, which happens to be the research lab where he is accidentally confronted by one of the newer models. Reshin interrupts in a mech and takes out his colleague. He shoots a giant blade at Shin who deflects it. The bandaged maniac points a giant cannon at Shin who can see it's dangerous. During that interim, Jinka rushes in with another attack, but he's knocked back. The sage activates his fairy eyes, which allows him to predict and dodge where Durin's attacks are coming from based on the distribution of his energy. The tiger comes in with another punch, but Jinka awakens a new power and counterpunches Durin with his left arm, which is made from condensed spirit energy. The tiger is impressed because it did some damage. Rinzu reveals that she can sense the goddess spirit power coming from the arm. Doran answers by revealing a new technique. Both he and Reshin fire their attacks at the same time at their opponents. Shin evades by using his sword's wind power and responds with a punch to the unsuspecting mummy. This triggers Arabuki to scold Shin for hitting his opponent instead of cutting. Shin wants a change of scenery, so he lures Reshin to a different part of the lab. Elsewhere, Jinka can't dodge and is hit with the crazy attack that wraps time and space. The sage manages to get up, but his thoughts are fuzzy, so he uses his spirit hand to reach into his head to clear out the fog. This allows him to awaken another tail made of wind. Tama watches on worried that Jinka might be doing something too risky by tampering with his mind. The sage uses his new power to radically improve his mobility, allowing him to land a potent strike on the tiger. However, the monk recovers quickly and readies himself for Jinka's next attack. The sage decides to use his ultimate technique. He keeps Duren confined with his tails to ensure he gets hit, but the tiger is confident that he can close the distance before the off-brand spirit bomb lands. Both he and Jinka see a group of hooded individuals pass between them, so Duren pauses for a moment which allows the attack to hit him. The two ladies didn't see anything when Jinka asks them. The tiger emerges from the smoke acknowledging the sage's power and confesses that he depleted all his spirit energy and stamina to survive that blast. He asks Jinka to take his head as a trophy, but Tama is not interested in that. They walk past him, and he collapses shortly after. Yazen can't believe that his boy lost. He starts packing up ready to flee. The guy sees himself as a researcher and doesn't want to throw hands. The monk leader would rather not reveal Kuzunoha's existence to the world because the cover-up will be a nightmare. He intends to cut his losses and get Taizen to transform and destroy everything. The old man sees Reshin as trash now, so he doesn't mind losing him. Things transition to that fight, and Shin arrives in a room that has plenty of pillars. The Ronin uses them as launch pads to evade the beast leader's strikes. Arabuki notices that Shin's lack of spirit power and sword skill keeps him from restraining his wind. This is why the guy can fly so freely. The sword takes advantage of this and flies Shin around, saving him from Reshin's attack. This causes the ceiling to collapse, exposing the open sky. The sword takes him outside and Reshin joins him. The others arrive to find the two clashing intensely in the air. Arabuki is in a state of euphoria because he didn't know the sky was so free. He thanks Shin for showing him and promises to take him anywhere and finally acknowledges him as its master. Shin lets the sword know that he just wants to eliminate Reshin. The blade calls this goal insignificant and shows him the heavens where there is no horizon, no humans or demons, nor vendettas or hate. They are free because in the great sky, strength, weakness, and obsessions are all pointless. He bluntly tells Shin to sever his fixations and use his helm splitter technique to connect the heavens and earth. 
Arabuki promises to give him the power to do it. Shin can't believe that the personality he created for the sword reached enlightenment before him. He comes down with his strike and splits Reshin's mech in half. His party is amazed of the special attack. The monks guarding the paths hear the explosion and wonder what is going on. Inga tells them that it's nothing to worry about. Uhu comes to quietly report that Duren has been defeated and the laboratory is mostly destroyed. They speculate that Reshin has also likely fallen. Based on these things, the senior monk is sure that the Dangaesu will have to go back to their roots of being traveling monks who fought monsters. He is positive that this is punishment for forgetting their true purpose. They became too desperate for power. The battle is not over yet as a rabid Reshin pops out of the wreckage and hits Shin, which sends his sword flying into a tree. It turns into a brawl like Super Smash Bros. After trading a few blows, the Ronin eliminates Reshin with a punch that unravels the talismans holding his body together. Jinka can see that Arabuki has become a demon sword. Tama tells Shin to go home now that he has got his revenge for Shikugan. The Ronin will only rest when the source of these spiritually enhanced humans is taken care of. He gives his final goodbye to his arch enemy. Jinka and Shin have realized that humans and demons have the same energy. He is surprised to hear that the sage still wants to be a demon. Their little discussion comes to an end when Taizan makes an appearance. Rinzu summons her master who takes out the fortress with one kick. Yazen and Kuzunoha are forced to transform and face the party and the goddess if they want to escape. The goddess launches Tree's missiles at the old couple to prevent them from escaping. She apologizes to Taizan since he got hit too. Yazen manages to survive the onslaught by harnessing Taizan's power and turning it into metal for defense. They make a run for it again, and Tama instructs Jinka to throw her. She flies through the air and drop kicks her mother. The sage also attacks Yazen, but the head monk overpowers him with his two extra tails. He slates Tama for trying to ruin his partner's beautiful face. Jinka recovers and joins them ready to face the villain. Yazen gets annoyed just at the thought of the sage challenging him. He warns the young buck not to get arrogant because he beat the kitten that is Durin. Jinka is not intimidated and wants to know where Yazen's research documents are. He also wants to know what his relation is to his master. He refuses to tell him which triggers the sage to attack, which is blocked by double-bladed knives. As they clash, Kuzunoha believes her man will win, and Tama thinks the same about hers, but corrects her mother about her relationship with Jinka. She says she loves all humans. We learn that Jinka's father is Genzu and was the one who saved Tama when she was in need. As fate will have it, she met Jinka his son and became fond of him. Kuzunoha asks her daughter to join them. Tama slaps her hand away, saying that there is no need to turn into a human when people have already accepted her as she is. Her mother laughs and informs her that Jinka is about to become something inhuman. Tama turns to see Jinka eating parts of Taizan like he hasn't being fed. He comments on how tasty a god's flesh can be. Yazin lets him know that he will not be able to turn back to a human. That is music to the sage's ears, but he suddenly crashes to the floor and light and dark tail spawn from his back, which now matches Yazin's number of tails. The goddess remarks that what Jinka has done is bad, and that even his master didn't go this far. The old man is not sure how his body can hold given all the punishment it has being through. Jinka is willing to risk it all. The two clash on a high level, but the goddess noticed that the sage's power is increasing. Rinzu gets worried for her idol as he laughs manically. Yazen can see that the sage is on the threshold between clarity and frenzy. He and his partner know what to do after exchanging a look. The old monk baits Jinka to attack and uses a talisman to clone Tama so that it looks like he ended her. Kuzunoha quickly grabs and gags the real Tama and disappears to a different area. Yazen then pushes Jinka to the edge by blaming him. Jinka screams and unleashes his power before charging in. His true self is trapped in his subconscious mind, watching helplessly as his body moves on autopilot. Shin asks Rinzu to find Tama, since they know that it was an illusion. The Ronin hopes to help Jinka realize this. Rinzu worries for Shin, but the guy will not rest until Yazen tastes his cold steel. He asks his blade to assist him, all the while Jinka is running wild, just as the old man wants. Internally, he already knew that the Tama he attacked was an illusion. He tries to warn himself that Yazen is trying to lure him to the goddess. However, Shin stops that plan when he ambushes the monk leader and cuts him, but the Ronin also gets fatally wounded in the process. Kuzunoha gets worried that her bay is injured, but Jinka falls deeper into despair. The goddess looks genuinely concerned for the first time as the sage gathers Taizen's energy, she orders the crows to retrieve Rinzu because they are leaving. She reveals that the whole area is going to be stripped of life. The party's journey is about to end at this mountain. What they are witnessing is the birth of a god beast that is stronger than the nine-tailed fox. Shout out to Kurama. 
Tama's power is forced back to her, which causes her to grow a bit. Her mother explains that it is due to the overflow of energy. Jinka's attention turns to Rinzu. The goddess reaches for her when the cloaked individuals turn up again and causes a weird moment for the goddess. She manages to get hold of Rinzu and they transport out. Rinzu wants to save the others. Tama gets through to Jinka, even though he's cutting her air off. She also has him completely calm as she talks about them getting married, but Rinzu activates her soul call and exports Shin and Tama. Jinka loses it again and causes an explosion. It wipes out her observational Shikigami. She informs Tama that she has lost track of Jinka, and at his current level, he can be anywhere. Some time passes and Shin's wounds have been treated. Tama decides to leave him while she goes looking for Jinka. She promises that she will find him so he should wait for her. This brings the season to an end. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time for more Legendary Tales.